And that really wasn't fair, because I was only giving her one minute to the other two minutes of beating her up. Well, but she, she, got, she, she got a lot more segments than they did, too. Basically, all I was trying to even out the ratio, but, yeah. because there were two of them beating her up. Or was it just, you know, one's really pissed and both were really pissed? Yeah. Yeah. All right. You get done? Um, I'm, I'm sure they'll be back. They'll be back. They, they want to. They. And what's your suggestion, George? Yeah, it's rolling. Or do you do you need to change out? No, it's fine. Do you need to change out? No, it's rolling. Okay. okay. All right, we're back with uh, Henderson Municipal Court Department Three. So, candidate, please state your name every time you answer a question. Okay. And uh, we will uh, give you one minute. Okay. Actually, take your time. You're the only candidate up here. The other candidates later. Okay. Uh, my name is William Waters. And I'm from Henderson Municipal Court Department 3. I'm currently employed at the Clark County Public Defender's Office um, as an associate attorney. Uh, prior to working at the Public Defender's Office, I've worked in uh, private practice representing clients in civil matters. I've also I clerked for the Nevada Supreme Court when I finished law school and after I had passed the bar exam. And um, I'm originally from the Chicagoland area, moved to Las Vegas, Henderson, 1997, after I graduated from Boston College. Went to UNLV's School of Law in 2002, graduated two and a half years, passed the bar, been with the Public Defender's Office since 2005. Okay, I guess it's to me. <laughs> I mean, you're up. Richard Hawkins, attorney and economics professor. Uh, the currently, it's not realistic to expect any more resources to be provided to the courts. What can your court do to more efficiently use the resources that it has? Actually, I was personally astonished when I realized how much the municipal court judges make in Henderson. I didn't know. I don't make nearly that much. At the public defender's office, we're both civil servants. Uh, we're both paid by the taxpayers. I make almost a little bit more than half of the judges in Henderson uh, Municipal Court. Folks, folks, excuse me, folks. Um, I would. I, you have to look at. There's you know, the city attorneys, the courts. They work four days a week out there. It, it, if the if need be, I would be more than welcome to work Fridays. Right now, the city attorney's office and the uh, courts are closed on Fridays. Um, if that would assist in the administration of justice, getting people in and out of the court, having their cases heard, saving the taxpayers money, I would uh, certainly have no problem with uh, having courts on court on Friday as well. Uh, I would. This is an unpopular position uh, in some quarters, and I can appreciate that, but you have to look at incarcerating people and what you're incarcerating them for. Uh, it does cost money, it costs taxpayer money to house someone in the detention center. Uh, some estimates, it's up to $22,000 a year per inmate. Now, I know Henderson built a new facility and they're taking inmates from the Clark County Detention Center, North Las Vegas, wherever, to try to offset some of the costs, and I can appreciate that. In municipal court, the municipal court only hand handles misdemeanor offenses occurring within the city of Henderson. Now, the difference between a misdemeanor and a felony, for those who don't know, the felony is obviously, or, or is a uh, crime that is punishable by more than one year incarceration, and so you would serve a sentence in the NDOC, the Nevada Department of Corrections, NSP, uh, not in one of the local detention facilities. So. Misdemeanors who commit offenses within the city of Henderson will be housed in the Henderson Detention Center. Um, of the misdemeanor crimes that routinely come through the, Hen uh, the Henderson Municipal Court, uh, I don't think I'm going on a limb here. I would say that battery constitutes domestic violence and DUI are by far the most serious. And in certain cases, uh, depending on the facts of a particular case, that incarceration for up to six months may be the most appropriate sentence. Um, but the vast majority of issues that come from this report are traffic issues um, or uh, 
vagrancy kind of stuff, and uh, I don't see the point in incarcerating people uh, if they have no prior criminal record, if it is clear from the particular facts of the case that it was not particularly egregious conduct, uh, and that community service and fines couldn't satisfy the penal objective in that particular case. a moment to get settled and ask you the same question. Thank you. Please forgive me. I, uh, my sitter could not find the directions and we were way out there. So, deep breath and good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and wait, wait, Nick, do you, you want to give us your 60 second introduction? Uh, certainly. Uh, my name is uh, Diana Hampton. I am the Chief Judge of the Henderson Municipal Court out in Anderson. And I have been a sitting judge for the last five, almost six years now, and Chief Judge for the past four years. Um, I have created uh, quite a few programs to, I heard my opponent give uh, a brief answer to the question that I'm certain you're going to answer me, just uh, ask me in just one moment. And just briefly, I do want to say that I have created quite a few programs to help people um, that have been uh, either convicted or a crime, of a crime or are coming before me and that have pled to a crime. Um, so I would eventually have to go over those programs with you, but I'll wait for the questions. Okay, and again, Richard Hawkins, an attorney and economics professor. The question is, and I'm sure it's no shock to you that there's no more reset versus coming to the courts in the next couple of years. What could be done at this point with what resources there are to streamline things using the existing resources to make up more time for the other things that are overburdening the courts that aren't getting enough time? Um, an example of that, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the, the question... Well, how could what's there as resources now be used more efficiently? Obviously there's some high priority things that are taking smaller amounts of time than they really should get. What, what a um, trial by affidavit or veterans court or whatever? No, I mean, you're, you're, at, you're actually at asking a question to which there really is no solution. I mean, honestly, somebody can stand up here and give you this great song and dance that we can do this or we can do that. But I sit in that spot every day, and I know what goes on. And I can tell you that right now in the court system, we are pretty, we're running things pretty efficiently. Um, we have made cutbacks where we can. Um, I know that we are adding more... Uh, we are adding more calendars as far as traffic is concerned so that we can better address people who have the trials coming uh, for traffic. And so we are doing that what we can right now. And I can tell you that there is not a, a blanket answer to give you that we can do something specific to streamline anything. Okay, now that we do have both candidates here, um, we are going to keep the answers down to a minute. Now, when I get to 10 seconds, the green folder will come up. I'll show you that means you have 10 seconds left. Also, make sure that you're stating your name for the listeners at home. We are broadcasting live through the, via the internet. Also, we are videotaping this. This is going to be put on YouTube. So, if you have anything to say past your one minute mark, this will be not only posted on YouTube, but the Veterans of Politics Facebook page, to whereas you can write volumes on the Facebook page. Okay? So, uh, if I could have uh, Michael Mazur ask his question. Good afternoon. Uh, Michael Mazur, attorney. Uh, based on the current caseload in the court system, do you feel that there's a need for an appellate uh, court of appeals in the state of Nevada? Uh, absolutely. Regardless of the amount of caseload, I think that a, an appellate uh, court would be something that would be good uh, just in general. I think that we need that to get between uh, the lower courts and the Supreme Court, so I am absolutely all for that. William Waters. Um, with respect to municipal court in particular, the appellate process is that any appeal for municipal court goes into the district court, so it would go down to the 8th Judicial District Court, where a district court judge, and I think currently Judge Donald Mosley is, is handling all the, the misdemeanor appeals, he would handle that. But in a general sense, yes, I, I, I absolutely think so. And, and, Part of the problem is having worked at the Supreme Court, I, I understand how overburdened they are with the amount of cases as the only court of appeal. They publish very few cases, and as a practicing attorney, is almost you need guidance from the highest court in the state on what the state of the law is and how it's applied. And 
given their <clears throat> case uh, loads, they don't publish a lot of opinions. I think if an intermediate appellate court existed, we would get more published opinions, more clarity in the law, more consistency in the law, and I think that that would benefit um, every litigant who goes, comes into court. Thank you. Jack. Jess Brooks, uh, lawyer and physician. What is your position on, their, uh, on um, medical marijuana? Chief Judge Diana Hampton, um, I am for medical marijuana, um, especially if someone has a need for that. I think that right now um, our laws are a little bit too, in some sense, broad um, for what is given. I see people that come before me quite often <clears throat> that um, are applying for medical marijuana and there's absolutely no reason for it. It's just a, a young teenager that simply wanted to use the system to party. Um, I think if there is a need, and it's an, if it is a real need, absolutely I do believe that. You have 30 seconds No, I, I think that's all I have to say. But yes, I believe in that. Uh, William Waters. Uh, I don't have a problem with it. I'm, I'm a bit libertarian. If, if someone wants to do something that I don't see any harm to, towards any other person, and it's merely something they want to do, uh, in that sense, I don't have a problem with it. With, specifically with respect to medical marijuana, my brother, who lives in California, does have a medical marijuana card um, from the state of California because he is in chronic pain that he's had since he was a, uh, a teenager. And it, it seems to help him. And um, who am I to tell him that that is not helping him get through his pain? If you can verify it's coming from a legitimate doctor and not some charlatan who's just filling out prescriptions in the back of some storefront, then I would absolutely have no problem with uh, legalizing marijuana for medicinal purposes. And Chief Judge Shannon Hampton, I'll say that my opponent actually couldn't have said it better. <laughs> you both had like 40 seconds together left. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, Lou had a question. Oh, was go ahead. Good. I had an opportunity to sit in uh, some of the judges' courtrooms in the last couple of weeks preparing for this, and I noticed something that bothered me. I'd like to ask you, uh, being a judge is obviously a, a prestigious position, you know. I don't get called your honor all day, and I haven't worked as hard in that fashion as you guys have, and you have nice outfits, okay? <laughs> <laughs> My question is this. When you have individuals in your courtroom that might not be dressed in what you think is keeping with the decorum of the courtroom or might have tattoos that are uh, uh, offensive to you or a hairstyle etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, how do you contain your personal judgments at that point and not remark uh, on the taxpayer's dollar about your personal opinion of how someone is dressed or the manner in which they are carrying themselves thank you uh, Chief Judge Daniel Hampton, I'll answer that because that was in my courtroom where you had that, uh, that problem. And it was not a tattoo, and it was not a hairstyle. It was a young lady, a, a very young lady, I might add, that was 16 years of age, that was wearing a top to where you could plainly see um, her breasts. I and could they, not see them. Well, <laughs> Go ahead. They, they were, I was at the bench, mm -hmm. and, and they were staring at me. And I do have a problem when somebody wears something that is uh, distracting to the court procedure. I'm not saying that you know people come in all the time with earrings and with hairstyles, but that's their personal preference. I'm not going to object to that. That's not my job to say what you can and cannot wear until it becomes a problem when you're standing in before a judge and it shows disrespect to everyone in the courtroom. Then I have a problem. And it's funny because I actually thought a lot about that question, you having that problem. Um, and, you know, I stand by my decision to tell someone that what you are wearing is inappropriate and you need to either uh, cover yourself or change. William Waters. Uh, I'm a bit old fashioned and I do believe that there are certain, certain places where you should dress appropriately, church uh, and, and court being one of them. You, you need to demonstrate that you respect. Not, not if I'm if I'm a judge, it's not me necessarily. But I mean, this is your tech, the taxpayer's uh, courtroom, um, and, and that deserves a certain amount of respect. Uh, however, this is Las Vegas, and in the summer months, it gets extremely hot up here. And, and I do understand that it is uncomfortable um, to be in a suit and tie all day. Uh, shorts, I don't think is appropriate. Certainly, um, 
low cut or revealing outfits is inappropriate, but uh, like my opponent said, I don't, hairstyles, earrings, the, the tattoos, you know, I, I don't have a, a problem with that necessarily. I mean, it's, it's more, you know, demonstrate respect for the citizens' court. So. Chief Judge Jamie Hampton, and on that line, uh, we do have a dress code in the summertime when it does become very hot outside, and uh, we do allow people to wear shorts, and I ask my marshals to use um, basically common sense, because I know that there are some shorts that actually look better than some pants, and so I tell them, you know, if it looks like it, it passes the test of respect, then please let them in. <coughs> Good afternoon. Colonel Tomczak, USMC, retired. Uh, I'm actually going to follow up on a question that my colleague at the end of the table here uh, addressed. Uh, because you're a sitting judge, I know you already have an answer to this because you've been doing it so many years, but this gives you an opportunity to think about it while she's talking. <laughs> <laughs> veterans in politics, obviously, is totally associated with the you know, with veterans and what we do and you know who we're affiliated, what we're associated with. When we get into legal problems and, and have to go to court just like every other citizen, uh, the question I actually have is, and this has been discussed at some length outside this room sometimes, when you get a veteran that stands before you, you happen to know uh, that person's a veteran. Uh, sometimes I go out of the way to make you know they're a veteran because they want preferential treatment or maybe they just want you to know they've done something nobody else has done. When you make your decision at the end of the day, realizing you have to stay within the confines of the law, at some point, you have a personal, uh, you have the uh, opportunity to minimize your work. And I certainly can't get into any one of your heads, but I'd be very interested to find out from you, ma'am, if you take that into consideration. If you do, how do you apply it? I'd like to, actually, I'd like to preface that, puff up the, uh, the colonel's chest here a little bit so I can give you a little bit of background. How many silver stars do you have? Only one. Only one? How many bronze? Only one. Only. How many purple hearts? Four. Four. So, thank wanted you. to make sure that that thank was Thank you. And first of all, Colonel, I want to thank you very much for your service to our country. And I can tell you that what does it play a role in my courtroom? Absolutely, it does. Not when it comes to uh, listening to the facts and evidence. The facts are the facts, and I listen to them first and foremost. But when it comes down to sentencing, there are things that I, take, I can't take into consideration, and I do. I take them into consideration all the time. I'm going to give you an example. I have somebody that comes before me and they are, um, they, they pled guilty, say, for instance, on a traffic violation. And they come before me and they say, um, you know, Your Honor, I served for my country um, and uh, I'm running on hard times and I'm just really having a difficult time financially. I will, first of all, uh, thank them for their service to our country and then I will probably either fine them and suspend the fine, say, have no further citations for a period of three months and then you don't have to pay the fine and uh, this will be amended to a non-moving violation. I do that for not just veterans, but I also do that for people that are having financial difficulties and that people also that are coming before me that are getting ready to go into the service and serve our country, I also thank them for getting ready to go into their service and do try to work around whatever it is that they're going to do. Uh, William Myers. Uh, yeah, and, and as a public defender, I've represented numerous clients who are who have served in our uh, our military and um, you better believe in front of a judge I'm arguing that mitigation that is huge um, when you look at someone's uh, what a judge can can consider all kinds of things in making a sensing determination and a lot of the times they tend to focus on the negative aspects of someone's uh, past so yes if I if I represent a client who has military service in his past I absolutely tell the judge that and as a judge, I would take that into consideration. Um, uh, there's a veterans court in the district court downtown, and um, it was an idea that Barbara Buckley had. I've had two clients actually go into the veterans court. They're both doing pretty successfully down there. And I think that with respect to that, there was, a, there was a, a, an idea that veterans do suffer or deal with things that are different than your average citizen, and perhaps uh, a court that can structure programs for them would be uh, most beneficial to them. And I want to let the people at, know, uh, at home know that one silver star is way more than enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Hawkins? Uh, you, you guys dodged the question on elected judges, but here, here in Nevada, as a practical matter, the, the bar 
gets looked to a lot in supporting judicial candidates, recommendations, and we tend to be very hesitant to unseat a sitting judge, although I, I think to our credit we've lined up when it's needed to be done. Um, so without that type of support, you're unlikely to win here, not whether they're finding out or otherwise. So make your case to us. Why should we unseat a sitting judge at the moment? Well, the, the problem is the longer judges serve, the more comfortable they become. And um, sometimes you need a fresh perspective on what's going on in the legal community, in the, uh, amongst the citizens. Uh, there's a, I, I believe that there's a complacency in the Henderson Municipal Court right now. As I said earlier, I mean, Friday's off, um, you know, four or five hour work days. Um, I work, and in fact, I'm actually going to work after this because I have a trial starting on Monday, so uh, I'm keenly aware of our obligations to the taxpayers uh, to get things done um, on their behalf. So when, when you think about what's going on in Henderson, you want fresh perspective. You want someone who has unique experiences. And, and I think I have that, I, I, based on my experience as the Nevada Supreme Court and as a public defender. Would be unfair not to give you a response here. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chief Judge Diana Hampton. Um, I always have a fresh perspective. I try to take one in each and every day. I take the bench, and I'm sorry, but we do not work four and five hours a day. Okay, do we have Fridays off? Yes, we do. Um, that's one of the perks, and I'm not going to try to change that. I have uh, children that I am raising, and I enjoy the fact that we do have three days off. Um, every day, like I said, I walk into there and I try to see what can I do to make this Henderson a better place. I, I have children and I want them to grow up in Henderson knowing that this is a safe community. And as such, um, I have created the programs, uh, the Life of Crime program, which is geared towards choices that young people are, are making. And then I've also uh, created the AIDE, which is an advanced interactive training, uh, driving training program to help teens learn how to drive better and teach them that they're behind the wheel of a 5,000 pound weapon and that driving is is not a uh, right, it is a privilege. And so every day, like I said, um, I'm also trying to expand now if I do get reelected on the Life of Crime program to make it uh, even a uh, more intense program. Okay. Ask a question. Okay. You can add anything after on the Facebook posting or the YouTube video. My question is in concerns to a lot of the programs that uh, some of the judges send their uh, defendants to. Is that the right word? Um, when I was in your courtroom, Judge Hampton, uh, you were sending a lot of people to AIDE, I believe it was? Or That's AID. right, AIDE. AIDE. Advanced Interactive Driving mm -hmm. Education. And you were sending people to the, uh, uh, down to see the coroner. Coroner's visitation program. And during that process, like you said you would do for veterans or like anyone if they're having hard times, you would uh, cut their fees, right? And there's a small fee, normally less, uh, due at the program, but it's it's less than the fine you normally would be. So you cut their fine, and um, that, in some ways, you could say, cost the city some money, right? And uh, I would like to know, how do you as a judge, other than when, if I'm correct, you helped start AID, right? That's correct. Okay. So how do you keep an independent or, or an objective opinion of the different programs that you could be sending people to when uh, you yourself are already vested, not financially, but you know, with your heart and soul, because you should be. Um, how do you keep an, an objective opinion on, on what the best program is for these people and where are you getting the stats on your recidivism and the success of it? And uh, for yourself, uh, what do you think your position would be if you were elected? Thank you. Uh, Chief Judge Jenny Hampton, um, the uh, AID program, we uh, created that um, in 2007. And basically what it is, like I was saying, is that it is programmed to teach uh, teens that they are behind the wheel of 5,000 pound weapon and to give them a greater respect of what they're doing on the road. You and I, we have uh, years, I won't say how many years, but we have years of experience behind the wheel, and they do not. So this program basically uh, gets them behind a vehicle that's been altered and shows them what to do in a, in a skid, rainy weather, if somebody stops short in front of them and tries to give them some experience behind the wheel that they do not have. Um, as far as uh, the, me being biased to the program, I wouldn't say that I'm biased. I send them there and if anybody were to come to me and say, we have this other program in mind, absolutely I would, be, I would want to do that. 
I created the AIDE program because before I would send uh, kids to the coroner's visitation program or the victim impact panel, once again, to show them that they are, you know, a lot of kids have a tendency to be megalomaniacs, and so I want them to understand that they are mortal and that everybody behind the wheel is mortal. And so um, the, a, a mother came to me and said, you know, I just don't want the coroner's visitation program. And I said, you know, ma'am, I, I understand. Let's sit down together and see what we can do. And that's when we came up with the AIDE program. Um, like, uh, when, as you said, you've been in my courtroom. And what I do for all juveniles is I always make mom and dad appear with their kids. Number one, because a lot of times uh, kids won't tell their parents that they received a ticket. So <laughs> I want mom and dad to be there to prove that they have. And the next, I'll suspend the fine because I want them to learn. So I'll have them pay the program instead of the court so that they come back a well-educated, <coughs> better driver. Well, I bet it's kind of a good question. Thank you. Um, William really Waters. Whatever works. Um, if my opponent's program works and, and if, she, if she has the numbers to back that up, then that's fine with me. Um, people, people are in tough economic times right now. Um, they don't have a lot of income, if any. Uh, as long as it, you can do it where it's uh, effective towards recidivism, uh, minimal cost to the particular person and the taxpayers, and a program that works, I would have absolutely no problem um, sentencing someone to, to the program that best works, lowest cost to them, uh, taxpayers, uh, whatever, uh, whomever else. And Chief Judge, they have to do I get a brief rebuttal on that? I know it was the last question. Um, first of all, the AIDE program is open to anyone of any age who would like to go and just wants to learn how to drive better, so you are all invited to go. Um, you would have to pay, of course. Um, and the numbers of, since we started the program in 2007, that year alone we had 907 uh, juvenile citations alone. Since, nine, since 2007, the numbers have gone suddenly downhill to 2010, we had 607 juvenile citations that were written. Now, do I know that the economy and everything else does play a role into those numbers? Absolutely. But I would also like to think that it does get around that, um, you know, these programs do work and kids do share that knowledge. Not to mention that if somebody comes before my court, I am known to take driver's licenses if they are, do show an uh, amount of disrespect. <laughs> well, then. All righty. Thank you for Henderson Municipal Court Department 3. Uh, we are actually... Three minutes into the Boulder City Mayor's race, so if the mayoral candidate may please take the place of the fish kidder.